Um, my name is Harry Meyer, and I'm from uh, an organization called Southwest Organizing Project. We're a grassroots organizing project on the southwest side of uh, Chicago, um, the Chicago Long Market Park community. We've been in existence about 20 years for high school. We're a member oriented uh, grassroots organization that uh, we have 35 different institutions that are members of us uh, churches, schools. Diversity of faith. We have uh, Muslims, we have uh, Jewish congregation, we have uh, Catholics, Lutherans, uh, Protestants, uh, people in public, uh, public schools and, and private schools. So it's, it's a pretty diverse uh, organization. Uh, and and we the way we operate, we, we use uh, something we call the one-to-one -one conversation to really do all our work to start our work, and that just starts with conversations with people um, in the community to find out what are the issues that are going on, and uh, then we work on those issues and try to develop uh, leaders from the institutions that take the control to advance those issues. Uh, and so uh, we, after all these years, end up uh, working in the areas of education. Immigration is a, is a big issue for us in the community, violence prevention, um, and housing. There's one more I can't think of right now. And so uh, we have uh, about 15 uh, staff people. Most of them are, are organizers, and they go out and organize in an institution or two or, and or around an issue once it's been identified. In the schools, we do uh, after school programs. Uh, in a couple schools, uh, working with youth about youth leadership. Uh, we also work with parent mentor groups in 15 different grade schools, um, developing parents of kids in the schools to work in the schools for about 10 hours a week, and then we do some training with them uh, every Friday. And so uh, help them develop their skills and help them become uh, public leaders if they're interested in that. Uh, so uh, my my issue, I got, I got brought back to the community. I worked in the neighborhood, actually lived in this neighborhood almost all my life, uh, probably uh, about 45 of my somewhat over 50 years. Uh, I've been in the community, either living there or working there. And um, so it's, uh, you wish after all that time it would be, uh, you wouldn't need to work so hard and, would, and things would get better and you, know, you could move out, move out to other things or do other things. but. Uh, unfortunately, there's always other issues and other things to do with the community. So um, maybe uh, in the early 2000s, we were doing a lot of work trying to keep people in their homes uh, because predatory lending was a, was a significant, significant issue in the community. Um, people were getting loans that were based on their property values and, and property real estate was, you know, on the, on the never uh, Ending increase, and so uh, a lot of loans got made to people uh, that shouldn't have probably happened. A lot of loans got made that were um, probably uh, criminal in some respects because they actually stole equity from people in the community. So, in 2007, 2008, when the housing market crashed, we had tons of foreclosures, and uh, the aftermath is now tons of vacancies in the community. So I'm working on a vacancy issue. So I want to just talk to you a little bit about my particular uh, issue and uh, what we're talking about, uh, how we're calling it, uh, reclaiming Southwest Chicago. And this is our attempt to reclaim the, the community um, from the throes of the foreclosures and, and the vacancies that happen. So how do you change that? Uh, uh, yeah, or you just tell me next. The next will be good. So these are uh, this is a map of the foreclosures that uh, were initiated. It doesn't mean they all went through. And it almost looks like every house had one. Uh, and uh, from the last kind of the last period that we we uh, got the information on. So it's a big issue. It's not just our issue, but it's a big issue in our community. Uh, so over that period from 2012 to December 2013. 
you know, 1,800 foreclosures got started. So there was 1,800 homes that were uh, at risk, let's say. So then this is part of what happens uh, after some of those things uh, you know, uh, go to foreclosure or you know, sometimes people just walk away from it at, at some point. So we've got, we've been counting vacant properties for a couple of years now and um, most of the time we've been doing it um, on something, by something we just, it's, uh, Drive-by service, you know, just driving around, walking around, counting vacant houses, and um, consistently been averaging five to six hundred vacant properties in our in our small uh, geography, which is uh, about a three square mile area. Um, so some of the, these are some examples. Yeah. So six hundred vacant properties out of how many? Uh, I want to say probably it's around twelve thousand. Um, so it's not a big percentage, but it's a significant, you know, it's a significant, yeah, it's significant. And some blocks may have, you know, no vacancies. Some blocks may have one or two. Some blocks have had as many as 12. And that's really you know, pretty tough to try to claim those back. Um, you can go ahead and switch. So our, our plan is to, to concentrate redevelopment of vacant properties um, to try to get the market to respond the way the market should respond, uh, the way it should be at, uh, normal. We still are trying to keep families in their homes, we still do work on foreclosure prevention, um, try to help uh, uh, one of our organizations is neighborhood housing service, so there, there's a uh, there's a housing council there, and also the, um, the uh, Reach Center of Greater Southwest Development. So we can get people into counseling, we can get people's loans modified. Um, we were successful in keeping about 500 people in their homes, but there's a big there's a big pool of people that are in trouble, so we have to keep working on it. Um, what we're trying to do, though, is to reclaim it for people that are in the community so that people can take can benefit that are in the area from the redevelopment. And um, something we think is is creative and different that what we want to do when we redevelop properties is that, that as we're working on houses, rehabbing properties, we're also trying to create a pool of people that move into those places to buy them. Rent them and hopefully bring those people on at the same rate that we're turning over properties and, and units so that the properties don't go vacant again and you know, we can um, keep moving in a positive direction. And then we track our efforts, evaluate, um, do more data collection than ever. Um, part of SWAP's work is always to do an action and then reflect on it and then try to evaluate it and, um, and move ahead and <coughs> improve it if we can. So we'll continue to do that process. Yes. So uh, to do the concentrated redevelopment, we've teamed up with uh, Brinshore Development. They're a for-profit developer. They do a lot of work in uh, low-income, low-mod-income uh, redevelopment efforts. Redone some of the, uh, the uh, Chicago uh, CHA properties, and uh, they're a good developer to work with. Uh, and we, we want to purchase and rehab a significant number. And our goal initially was to do 100 units, and uh, to try to do that, we we made an application to the Attorney General's office, of the state. They had some money from uh, bank settlement to try and distribute. Throughout the state, um, we applied for $16 million because that's the number we thought we needed to, to do the job. We got three. So we can't be disappointed with $3 million, right? So that was our first um, big chunk of the, uh, the money we need to, uh, to do the work. And that came, we awarded that last June or July. 
and shortly after I started working at Clean Swap. And um, we haven't seen the money yet, so we're uh, every day it's any day now we're going to get the money, and uh, then we can start doing the work. Uh, we've identified probably six properties that we are initiating um, architectural work and stuff like that to, to be ready when the money finally comes down so we can close on the, on the properties and then get into uh, rehab as quick as possible. Since that money came through, um, <coughs> the city of Chicago uh, agreed to uh, commit to a $900,000 uh, grant to us. And then uh, in January, Governor Quinn committed $4 million for the state, so it's about almost $8 million. And, uh, you know, we haven't seen anybody yet, this. So we're hoping that one of these days we'll get some money. And we're hoping that we can get the money or, or uh, ironclad agreement with the governor because we're not so sure he's going to be around at the end of the year. So we'd like to be sure we're going to get the money. Um, and we're going to keep working on trying to raise more funds for that process. We've talked to Senator Durbin. We've had him out in the community and, and uh, tours out there. Uh, the, the good thing about not getting the big hit all at once is we've been able to, you know, go out and do fundraising and talk to people and get more people on our team. Right so uh, we'll continue to, to do that work. So. So, uh, okay, so here's our target geography. That uh, big rectangle on the, on the right, that's our target area. It's uh, three square miles. 51st Street on the north, 74th Street on the south, western, and Kedzie. Um, and then inside that is a smaller geography called the MMRP which is a micro-market recovery program area. We're one of well, maybe 15 or, or so, maybe there's more now, neighborhoods around Chicago that have a micro-market recovery area. It's a designation by the uh, city department of planning and development. And uh, we've been involved a couple years. Uh, I think we wanted to be involved because it seemed like there would be resources that would be it would be easier to get from the city to work on these properties. And you know, resources meaning dollars, not necessarily but a lot of dollars coming our way, but uh, it is an attempt to focus attention. Uh, we meet regularly. We have uh, other neighborhood partners like uh, Neighborhood Housing Service, like I mentioned, and uh, Community Investment Corporation um, and Mercy Housing all working on the issues of vacancies and Abandoned buildings throughout Chicago. Every every month or two, we have a focused conversation about our community and, and the work that's going on. And um, so we're trying to use that that smaller area as our kind of focus. It's kind of the hardest hit area. Just about it's not exactly go a little bit to the east to the right of that box. It's probably the, the hardest hit blocks, but. Um, it's an area that, if you drove down it, most of the streets look, look pretty good, but it can come back, we think. That, so we started working there and want to build out from there. And when we focus on our, um, we're, you know, spreading out from there uh, with our redevelopment. So the idea is to try and do enough units in a small enough area so it has an impact and uh, that you can spread out. So this is just an example of, uh, Brinshaw did a similar project in Evanston about a year ago. They did 100 units up there. This is the before and the after should uh, come up just as you uh, press the button. It's a, it's a quick one, yeah. And then, so this is not the kind of housing stock we have. Uh, as you can see, ours is a lot, a lot more brick and uh, is and it's a good thing because it holds up to deterioration a lot better than, than the frame houses. 
But uh, we see a lot of examples in the British mm -hmm. So uh, I think, again, I, like I said, the, the key is for us to build a pool, build a pipeline so that we can have people in the uh, that are clamoring for these patterns and uh, ready for them when, when we're ready with them. Uh, we've got about 150 people in the pool right now. Probably 75 or so of them are, are uh, viable. So the people that we think we're going to be able to move along. We're going to work with all of them that are interested in staying in the community, and uh, we'll hope to you know bring them all up to uh, whatever level they want to get to for uh, housing, sale, or, or rental in the community. And uh, we're focusing again on our on our leaders in our in our institutions because they're already committed to the community. They're, they're working on the school board. They're working in the schools. They're uh, they have a desire to stay in the neighborhood. So, uh, and just as just as we've announced a couple of properties that we've uh, that we've identified to work on, we've got people that you know want to live in the building when it's done. We've got the multi-unit right across the street from one of our uh, day schools, grade schools, and uh, we could probably rent that out if it was ready. In a couple of days because people were really excited about it. <laughs> Real quick, so these properties they have to be used for actual residents? Well, the ones we're doing are going to be for for rent, uh, for residents. Um, I mean, there are other properties around them that can, can do some of those other things. And we've, got, we've got other partners that might be working on those kind of angles. Uh, there's an organization that's a member of ours called Inner City Muslim Action Network. They've also done a rehab of a, a two-story property. And they've dedicated space in there for community center for community uh, activity. So yeah, I mean, it, right now it's still a lot of balls in the air, and we're not sure exactly what it's all going to look like in the end. But uh, no, they're going to regulate how much who can live in them. Right. They're going to say how much income they can have, and who can benefit from them, um, which is, um, you know, which is their right. And so every stream of money has its own constraints like that. And, uh, but we're going to have to do some apartments, uh, some units for people at 60% of median income, 30% of median income, 100%, 120% median income. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any pro any programs that would go for people that are just regular market people that thought this is a great place to live. But if they've got all the money in the world, I guess it's the Fed's thing. Like they should just buy it then. Yeah. 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 Well, we haven't done it yet, so we're hoping that that's the case is going to be. And we're trying to the model that we've used with the parent mentors is kind of have cohorts of people and institutions going through a process. We're trying to uh, sort the the people that are in the pool to find out what their barriers might be. Um, credit is one, and so getting them in good credit is going to be helpful to get them going. Um, but uh, some of them have uh, income as a barrier, and that's going to be tough to you know, get over that one. Um, but we're trying to work on what those issues are and, and figure out how, how if we can help them. And then if we can figure out other tools or um, things that the banks would, you know, uh, instruments that they would lend towards, uh, yeah, we, we have a lot of people that are uh, undocumented in the community. Uh, a lot of them have very good income, a lot of them own homes. But, uh, and some of them might want to buy a second home. It's hard to do that. Uh, it's hard to get a loan in the first place if you just have an I 10. So uh, there was some of that lending going on a few years ago, and it's not really 
So we're trying to figure out what the issues are, you know, as, as we sort through what happens. What's the process or what's the what's the how do you actually get the work done? Yeah. Well um, we would probably lean on Grinshore for that part. They've been doing this for you know part of their part of their work for a lot of years and, and uh, they have they've got the capacity to do it so we probably you know uh, work yeah. with yeah work with them. You know not completely outsource it because we like to keep Connected to what's going on and be sure that we're all on the same page with it. But uh, you know, they would be the lead. On it. They're also going to be the lead on management of the property. Because uh, we don't really want to be in a position of owning and managing a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, so what would your data source? Yeah. We'd have to work with you in your situation and you know find out it wouldn't be a data source, it would be a credit score and then regular things. Right, but I'm saying how come in you guys have your own relationship? We don't have any relationship with and we have relationships with a lot of banks. We don't have anything formal. So <laughs> so you know we would do whatever we could to advocate, you know, best outcome for you. Yeah, no, okay. Uh -huh. We have, um, over the last year, I, I think we've got more databases and, and more uh, data stuff coming at us than, than uh, we ever had before. We have, uh, we have uh, a database, yeah, that does keep track of the people in the pool. Right. Yeah. So we take you in, yeah, there is an intake process. Then we do a one-to-one -one conversation. And then we try and get you on a track that's right for you, whether you need to go counseling. And, and yeah, we can that's not working that well right now, that data that data process. But um, it's something we, we um, have worked with uh, with LISC, local local initiative support corporation. And uh, and it's through uh, Chapman Hall at the University of Chicago. So uh, we're trying to get, we're, you know, they developed a bunch of databases for, uh, because of the funding world really wants to know, is this stuff working? And so, you know, narratives don't do it enough anymore. So we have to have data that can provide, you know, information to them that, that shows that it's working or not. So. Uh, in our case, we developed a database that was going to um, track people in the pool, and then at the same time, uh, leadership development for people that come in contact with us. And uh, initially, it was going to be for properties too, but uh, I've been using really other other sources for that because uh, it just didn't seem like it was a uh, quick enough turnaround for me to, to go to. To, to hope that it was going to, I'd have some data in there to uh, give me what I needed for a particular property. It's, it's a lot easier to just find out what's for sale right now, or, uh, you know. Um, the, the one thing that, that I've been using to collect data on vacant properties we're going to talk about in a minute is uh, something called local data, and it's a tool I've been using uh, for about six months to. Uh, to uh, count the vacant properties. So, how is it determined that a vacant property is one that's possible for you to buy? Well, it you know it could be on the market right now. So, uh, but we've gotten uh, we get we're working with. Trying to work through banks to see what's in their REO uh, inventory. Uh, we do get some things like that from time to time. Our relationship with Mercy uh, helps us get some properties like that sometimes. 
they, they have uh, knowledge of some of that before before we find out about it. Um, uh, we really have just been counting vacancies, you know, and so once we've counted them, we've been using that to tell our story, but we really don't know that much about all of them, you know, individually, and so we're trying to get to a place where we can figure out, you know, in, in a better way what we could do with which properties. Do you have ownership on all of these? Do you know the ownership on all the properties? No. Yeah. I mean, we're talking 12,000 properties. It's, you know, no, the, 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 the vacant. No. And they're all, uh, we can find it out, but, you know, uh, we haven't got into figuring out every particular one because we're trying to fill out from this. How many have you? Um, I'm not sure what the number would be. I mean, we can. We have access to the city and the county records to, to track what's going on with stuff and track some of the properties that are building for. Um, and we investigate who owns what. Sometimes you, you sometimes you find out that uh, this person had died and you can't. There's nobody, nobody else that's um, around it to uh, deal with the property. Uh, banks have uh, released the foreclosure liens, and uh, <coughs> people and, and the properties are just sitting there. They have they haven't taken them back. So every building's got kind of its own story, and so instead of <coughs> going at it that way, we've been just kind of picking out properties that are in, you know, in an area and going after. Find out more information on those specific properties. Here, for the city and county, did you know um, is that data generally open data? Um, not. I mean, not, there's not general knowledge about. No open like it's accessible for anybody. Yeah. Okay, it's not like you had to get it from a special. No, source. the county is okay. the county, the court of deeds, and. Uh, there's a couple of places that, that have a lot of information. You know, the court, all the court stuff is on, is easily accessible. Anybody can, you don't have to be a member of anything, or you can just. Uh, Next building, occupancy. It'll tell you more about what foreclosure or what kind of what kind of information, uh, in building violations, things like that. You can get not so much who's living there or, or the occupancy. It'll tell you last known owner sometimes, but still, still sometimes it's. It's tricky to get back to really who's, who's controlling it. Yeah. Um, so I know um, one of the leading causes of foreclosure is because kind of a, a lack of financial education. So like people get into these mortgages, but, you know, like for adjustable rates, for example, they get these mortgages and she, she doesn't just have anymore. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering, um, to sustain the redevelopment of the are there any considerations for the financial literacy programs in the community? Or? Well, yeah, I mean, part of it is uh, individually credit counseling and that kind of incorporate that. <laughs> I know there's one uh, one of our member institutions that's interested in something along those lines, but yeah. Um, I mean, it's a kind of a different world than, than it was back in the uh, you know, early 2000s. And so, um, yeah, education is one thing, but uh, there are a lot less people that are, that are Trying to work on people that aren't that educated anymore. You know, the, there's not as much victimization going on because there's not as many people doing that. So, um, but yeah, that's a good step one. Um, so I have a question about the Department of Public Works. Um, you mentioned that you have a lot of information on the Department of Public Works. Okay, so these are just a couple, couple of shots. This is, a, yeah, like I said. Uh, about 35 institutions, schools, churches, businesses, and um, and then we have 19 of them in our right in our core geography. So that's why we feel pretty good about trying to build our pool from that area. Yeah. So, you know, what you just say, how are these stakeholders and what is the fact? 
Well, they have, they're committed to the community already. I mean, they, they have a stake in the neighborhood. They're, they're active in their institutions and the churches and schools. So, yeah. Are any of these schools uh, probably get shut down? I, probably all of them, almost. You know, I mean, if you look on, uh, I don't know which one does it, uh, Trulia or one of those, uh, will give you a score on the schools in the community. We've got everything that's terrible. But uh, we've been working at Morrell Grade School in uh, for a number of years, and it's been a struggling school. But uh, people want their kids to go there, you know. So uh, I don't know. I'd love to see that whole school scoring thing get taken out of the picture because it's really, uh, I think, uh, not accurate. That really, what's going on, and it's, I don't know what it's really being based on, but. Uh, it's really not a positive for our community because if you looked at that, you'd say, yeah, I would not know this. My kids are truly a, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a website that, uh, the real estate kind of website. Um, what they use is something called a great school score. And, you know, I, you look at, the comments from the great schools website on the schools, and it gets an eight, but people have been complaining from 2009, 2011. I mean, uh, nobody, there's no current comments on there. I don't know if you even want to, you know, give anybody uh, any kind of credence for the comments you put on, positive or negative, but I don't know if that's the best way to, to say it, to score a school. Um, so, you know, there's, the school environment is really tough, and that, that's part of We have uh, regular public schools, but they're at, they, they have to compete against charter schools and everybody else, and the resources get you know, used up, and then they don't have them for their school, and so their school gets a bad score. I mean, it's really kind of doggy uh, dog out there on that level. Uh, and so we're trying to help people think about how schools ought to be, um, how new schools ought to come into the community. You know, it shouldn't just be any charter school that got an idea should come in. We've, we've supported charters in our neighborhood and we've opposed charters in our neighborhood. Part of the thing is we want the, we want the charter school or a new school to have a new take on something new to bring to the table as far as education goes, whether it's a particular kind of curriculum or a particular population that they're going to try and serve. And to work with us on helping us incorporate the values of the community into their plan. A lot of times you'll get a note of, you know, a month before looking for support for a school that wants to come into the community. And every year now, you know, since the charter thing got started, every year the city accepts applications. So they just, you know, anybody can apply and they do. So, anyway, that's a bit long off your track, but uh, I wanted to talk about, I guess, local data a little bit. So, um, okay, um, I just talked about a little bit of my uh, my data collection journey. When I started uh, doing the, uh, the vacant property surveys, this was my data collection tool. Uh, I've got pages of you know, Fairfield, Campbell, all the different blocks, just driving around, writing numbers down. And uh, then I got to take the, the notes and transcribe them onto something else. So it's not really efficient. And, um, that's properties. There's the, on this on this view. There's 449 vacants. If you, um, Christopher, if you click on uh, yes, <coughs> it'll just pop the uh, the vacant properties. So.
so anyway, this is the, the new using. Um, it's really kind of efficient for collecting data, and it puts it charts and ropes automatically, so you can look at it and uh, export data from it. Um, but it's taken me since the beginning of the year to, to this morning, really, to get all my data in there. So it's really a process that I got to get better at because I can't keep doing it that way. Uh, we, we need to keep current on what's vacant and uh, so, yeah. yeah, well, I was doing it with the pen, pen before. Um, now I use this app, Local Data. It's on my phone. Um, it's a questionnaire that has these questions on it. I can just go down and uh, answer the questions that apply. And I can add information like if it's for sale, who the for sale uh, company is. Stuff like that, um, but I can only do if I'm doing it myself. I can only do yeah. about a half mile in an hour. So uh, it's really something I have to. Other places I've used this. They've done it in Detroit. They've done it in Gary, and need to have a day or two just data collection, and just get a group out to collect data. So that's what I'm gonna. That's what my next next couple of things I'm gonna be working on, getting a group together so that. Because 449 vacants from January to June isn't a real good, you know, slice of time. So, yeah, yeah, that's the, that's really the best way, you know. And the the other thing that took time on this is I wanted to do every property um, because the problem with doing it uh, visually from the car or whatever. You don't always know what address is there. You don't always know if the address is correct. Uh, you know, sometimes there's no address for a couple houses, and you're guessing. So this way, it, you're able to um, see the the uh, outline of the property and click on it. But I just wanted to, for one thing, we we incorporated all the data we had for the last couple years of what was identified as vacant. We had a, the first question on the Form was was it previously identified as vacant? So we entered all of that in there. It was a thousand properties that were, over the two-year period, at one time or another, were identified as vacant. Uh, so that took some time, and then then I thought, and I don't know if it was the right thing to do, but I, I went, like to try and build a a data <coughs> profile on almost every property. So the other thing this allows us to do is um, take a picture of the property, so you can add a picture to it. Which is, you know, as we go forward, it'll be, I think, real useful. Um, so yeah, so the big data collection, I think, is the best way to get a moment in time kind of uh, kind of data. But you're exactly right about who knows what is the people on the block. And I often talk to people when I'm doing it to see, you know, what exactly is vacant or not, because um, I'm trying to get the most accurate. Stuff. And then once I get that, I can go back and figure out, you know, what we can do, where we want to, where we want to try and focus, what we want to work on. You can see if uh, you want to yeah. close that for a second. This is kind of where the where the MRP area is. So that's pretty much it's not the most concentrated areas. It's pretty close to the most concentrated area of the uh, properties in the area, in our target area. So, yeah. You said that you're looking for like a post update presentation. How different is like that? Is it truly yet? Yeah. Do they have that proposal section? How different is what you're actually seeing for some of I don't know if I want to go with, you know, I don't know if I trust that kind of information. The foreclosure stuff we get is um, information we get from the courts or, or what have you. So we know about a month after. So within a month's time, we know what's currently uh, in the court docket. You know, so um, and that you know pretty reliable. Truly, really I don't know. You know what 
what they might have. Because I think a lot of people are, a lot of the properties that, well, I don't want to say a lot, but some properties I know really aren't available because they're in the middle of a foreclosure process still might get spotted on a website that says, you know, make an offer on this property because real estate people or, or whatever may be trying to uh, just get some business and, you know, whether it's good, bad, right, or wrong, I don't know, but uh, it's confusing at least. So, so um, but after going through this process, you know, uh, what I like about using local data is that the, uh, the information can be, you know, displayed like this and you can scroll down every question and get another view of that information. So if you went down a couple of questions, um, type of structure, you can start to look at where single family homes, multi units, um, you know, spread. <coughs> so this was a survey that we created ourselves. Um, the guys that did local data had one that was based on what they did in Detroit and Gary, and there's a lot more vacant land there. So the first question was, is there uh, a building on the property or something like that? And in our case, it's yes most of the time, so we just took that out. We just wanted to know is it vacant or not. And um, we're sure, if, for the most part, we're sure if they're boarded up, they're vacant. It's not always the case either. So we found places, one of the pictures on that uh, shot of all the vacant properties, they actually had a, a two-flat that, that a person was living in. It's all banged up and boarded up. A guy was living in there. And it was, he was the owner of it. It wasn't just uh, a squatter in there. So um, that was a real, that's a real unusual case. but. You know, that's trying to find out exactly what, again, you got to talk to people on the block to, uh, to really know that. So that's what I'm going to be, that's my next phase is my, in my work is try to find people that I can get that information. And then we're going to just put in, if it's vacant, we're not going to go through the whole process of every property. Uh, but I thought that, you know, at least we have, you're able to click on it. You can click on those properties like Christopher was doing, and it will it will show you uh, the information for that particular property. And uh, you can change this survey as it goes along. So we got information that, that we can incorporate foreclosure, current foreclosure stuff. We could add is it in foreclosure or where is it? Um, and so it would keep the other information, but just add. Uh, you know, other other information to that, which could make it a little richer for us. When you buy this in this uh, process, how do you guarantee title? We'd have to get title. We'd have to do normal title type of search and title insurance. I would say yes. Yeah. 